guided by, for example, leave no one behind, voices of the community. How important is that for moving forward and ending stigma and discrimination? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's uh, it's very important, of course, and it's important for those to not just be slogans, but to be things that we interrogate and say, are we making progress? You know, how do we know if we're leaving people behind, if we're not measuring that gap? You know, how do we uh, know that we are uh, amplifying and helping to secure space for community-led organizations unless we see them? Uh, in various parts of the response from the governance and decision-making to the direct service delivery to the accountability and measurement in the field. And so, you know, I think as we, you know, looked into this year and with this new global aid strategy that actually focuses on ending inequalities, you know, to end AIDS, um, this issue of being real, getting real, getting more specific about who those people left behind are, because I think in any country and certainly around the world, as we do better, it's gonna be new people that are left behind. As we close one gap, we have to refocus on the next gap. And in fact, even on some of the new targets that sound simple, like moving from 90, 90, 90 to 95, 95, 95 for treatment coverage, for example, um, really the difference isn't going from 90 to 95, it's actually going to 95 for each affected subpopulation. So that small numbers of highly affected people don't get lost in the mix. They're not hidden by the, the tyranny of the average or the national counts. And so I think that commitment to really trying to lay bare who is being left behind now, how do we change that? And how do we keep asking ourselves what's next is really truly important to this hopefully really effective next five years of the HIV response. Okay, thank you so much. Devon, I hear you're back with us. Perfect, I tell you in the age of technology, we lose internet, we come back on and so on, we navigate. So I was asking you earlier because NFPB is doing so much of an excellent work. You're partnering, just guide us through that. I don't want us to lose you again. You know, this morning, uh, I. I decided I wasn't going to sit by the riverside and, and show off the beauty of Jamaica and sit on a rock. I said, I'm going to come into the office, make sure I have uh, the office, I have I'm secured internet, and as we say in Jamaica and city. But <laughs> um, first of all, um, I'd like to depart, start off where, Sh um, if you may allow me to call you Shannon, um, Dr. Hader departed. I love that phrase, the tyranny of the, the averages. Um, it was another UNAIDS uh, consultant here in Jamaica, an advisor. Uh, while I was, um, we, you know, we managed a technical working group and with, that includes JASL and GM Plus and all the various agencies. And there we were talking about objectives and these high level conversations. And uh, the, the, the the advisor, I won't call anybody's name because she might be working with Shannon now, said, that is all good. But what happens to the person on the street? Um, how is it affecting them? And it is for that reason why I'm so proud of the relationship and the partnership that we're building outside of health settings to recognize that when it comes to HIV and AIDS, we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about their children. We're talking about their destiny, their legacy, because we, we, we tend to forget the mental health aspects, the issues of growth, us uh, not only surviving, but thriving and doing this in an environment in which you're living with a chronic illness, meaning that you must have access to life-saving and in many cases, life-giving medication and services. It therefore means that as much as I would love as, as an agent of the Ministry of Health to concentrate only on the dispensation of medication, I have to remember that people have to work. That person's dignity required that they must have education for themselves and their children. That a person should not feel victimized 
or less than empowered to seek assistance if their nosy neighbor decides to take it upon themselves to run them out of their community or start a whisper and a rumor campaign about them in church and think that that is something that they can get away with. I am speaking frankly like this because it allows people to recognize that when we speak of stigma and discrimination and human rights in Jamaica, or us, the National Family Planning Board, it is not a, let me use a term that's what a, a person likes to use that I respect so highly, but it reminds me of the challenges we face as a response as it relates to enabling environmental human rights. Nebulous utopia, ay ay ay. When I hear that, I tell you, I've been hearing that as the director for a while. And um, when, I, when we approach UNAIDS, um, I see we don't often remember the technicians in the room. So I will call out Ruben, who is on the line. And I said, Ruben, this is the vision that we, I have, we have for enabling environment for human rights. I want to accomplish, the, before I demit, who knows? We want to accomplish these things. Um, I'm glad that Shannon has mentioned the dashboard. Um, the reporting, the annual report that we're launching, that we're launching, the operational, operationalizing that moved from the nebulous <laughs> to something that we can actually say we are impacting people's lives. But we are also reaching the duty bearers. Because the truth is, as Javian had alluded to before, and as our state minister has said so full throatedly, as we move to improve people's lives, we must also recognize that there are still significant historical intergenerational barriers there. Okay. Um, it hurts that you know, the issues of policy and legislation are not moving as quickly as we want. But as my friend from UNH reminded me, policy and legislation alone does not put, does really doesn't make, a, you must then make, make other changes. Education, health, labor, justice, but most importantly, community engagement. Because you can move political will and will evolves when there is a demand for change. When persons see the messages that says, hey, you can have positivity in church, in our communities. So I say all of that. To say that as you think if you have 10 more person, seconds, go on. Yeah, it's 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 really that's important. That it's how do you impact persons' lives, not only in the policy and legislation, but on the ground where they live, where they must get services, and where they must live with people every day, morning to night, and must have access at all times. So it's a challenge. But it's it's great work, and I'm so glad to see the report that reflects this. All right, thank you so much, Devon. And and again, NFPB would have charted the way with a lot of the interventions that were mentioned. No, <laughs> Devon is, is is. And by the way, I just want to say NFPB would have partnered with other agencies with the respect tour. Devon gave yeah. us the sober reminder about the work on the community. Um, in the communities. So the respect tour was out there, but again, COVID came about. But to move on, we do have a question in the chat and we're encouraging other persons to submit their Q&As. If you are unable to submit it that way, you can just put it in the chat as we normally would, and we are looking at it. So I'm seeing a question for the minister. I, I think she's still on the call here. Let me double check. I think we lost her. She's having some internet challenges. Okay. But the question here was to the minister, but 
perhaps NFPB could, could take this in 10 seconds or about 15 around the fact that stigma and discrimination continues to be a challenge. The question was really, as a legislator, would Minister Cuthbert Flynn stand readily to support a broad anti-discrimination legislation? should one be submitted before parliament. So I, I was going to put that to, oh, the minister is here. So I'm not sure if you were hearing minister, the question that was fielded for you, you're muted. Can, can you repeat that question again? The question was around, would you stand ready to support a broad anti-discrimination should one be put before parliament? Well, um, I think we'd have to explain what broad anti-discrimination is. I think, um, as stated in my message, we still have a long way to go culturally in Jamaica. And so I think what you mentioned about um, before, before we even get to legislation, we have to look at educating the population. I think it is, it is of utmost importance that we educate the population first, because I think there's still a lot of myths out there um, about um, you know, the, the groups that we're talking about um, in, in Jamaica. Um, culturally, I think it is also very important and also good that we've been engaging the faith-based organizations and the different um, civil society groups. So I think the first thing that we must do um, is to educate the population. And one of the good things about this um, whole campaign and what we're trying to do uh, is to get the, the parliamentarians involved, right? And I think if we can get the parliamentarians involved, make information easier on the ground because the politicians are on the ground and they move with the people. And so I think one of the things that we must do is to devise a educational campaign, um, is to get the politicians um, involved, to get the civil society groups involved, to get the Ministry of Education involved, to get um, the Ministry of Labor, all the different ministries and all the different um, groups to make sure that we do that first. And then we can move into talking about changing legislation on a whole, because now we would have educated the population. Um, I think Jamaicans like to be spoon fed. You, they don't just like things to be thrown at them, not understanding fully, not knowing what it is that getting into. And I think that is when we get a pushback. We don't want that. And so I think um, the way in which we're trying to move slowly, um, even though we want to progress fast, we want to definitely make sure that the, edu the population is properly educated and knows what it is that they're getting into, what it is that this legislation is about um, for them to agree to and sign off on, and also for the parliamentarians to understand fully what is at stake. And yes, definitely once that is done, I am definitely for, um, I lived in a country in the United States where um, you know, you have discrimination law and, 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 and again, stigma and discrimination. And so we want to definitely move on to the fact that we have signed on to this global partnership. It means that Jamaica, um, the government stands ready to do whatever is possible to make sure we get there. Okay. Thank you so much, State Minister. So public education and ensuring that parliamentarians are also aware of what this anti-discrimination is while we do it in the general public. I'm going to take it from Ms. Lovett Byfield of the National Family Planning Board. And then we do have two questions from, well, I think a few questions from the Jamaica Gleaner, and then we will go to Mr. Ricky Pasco. Um, Ms. Byfield, go ahead for us, please. Thank you, thank you, Michaela, and thank you for this opportunity. I just wanted to add to what the minister said in terms of the movements that we are making and in terms of the actual partnership that we have taken on board since 2020. It has meant that we have been looking at our technical working group in the, with the EEHR and to see how best we can revitalize and get back on board a number of the other ministries, departments, and agencies, so we can strengthen the multi-sectoral partnerships. One of the things that we have recognized is that 
persons need to have real issues and recognize what needs to happen within their sector in a very specific way in order for us to move forward. And so we are working to ensure that our partners, especially within the government sector, are, are understanding how it is that we have to address the issues and what can be done within their particular sector to deal with this. So um, this is how we, we propose to move forward. We also acknowledge that our partnership with the CSOs have really been strengthened and we have seen where the work with the faith-based organizations and JCC in particular has helped to move the conversations into other settings. And so we're hopeful and it is progressive and we will continue to see results from this partnership. From this partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Byfield. Again, signaling the commitment of the National Family Planning Board and, it's, it, and, and how it works with the other agencies. From the Jamaica Gleaner, I'm, I'm going to throw it open to the panel. How far, what is PrEP and how far along is the program and what are the results of PrEP so far? Anybody on the panel can take that? I see Michael muted. I think that's best answered by you, Michael, being from Jasso. <laughs> All right, the base. Okay, so the pre-prophylaxis program is a preventative measure to ensure that those who are high risk of contracting HIV, that transmission risk would have been significantly reduced. So, so far, the Jamaica AIDS Support for Life and the Ministry of Health and Wellness would have entered a partnership last year. In terms of the results that we have had, I was not prepared to answer this, but we would have had some 41 men on PrEP last year and they're moving along quite well. But what I can commit to the Gleaner is that I can share another paragraph after this because I don't want to speak out of turn around the PrEP initiative because I was not prepared to answer. I was told I'm a moderator, but I am prepared to share it and I can put together a little telephone conversation to be had with the individual from Gleaner. The next question that is asked is, what is the level of discrimination in the inner city areas and would you characterize those areas as more challenging than others? Jamoki, I'm going to feel that question to you and perhaps you can reframe and, and clarify. All right, thank you. Um... <clears throat> So the Jamaica Anti-Discrimination System for HIV, which is a mechanism operated by JN Plus collects um, complaints or reports of stigma and discrimination towards people living with um, and impacted by HIV. So in 2020, for example, we had 79 reports of this HIV related discrimination. Majority of those are centered or anchored in communities, whether it's inner city communities, rural communities, urban, etc. Um, and we recognize that it's it's within these particular communities that the person living with HIV feels um, stigmatized, the most discriminated, the most are not necessarily when they access healthcare or on their jobs, etc. It's just by simply walking through their communities, being kicked out of their communities, their families, their relatives treating them unfairly. No, I don't have specific data for inner city communities. The only data I can ha I have so far is to say that majority of our discrimination cases are based in communities, physical communities, locations. And it, it continues to be a huge problem <clears throat> in terms of where we are when we talk about stigma and discrimination in Jamaica and how people living with HIV are treated. And the Global Partnership is one such initiative that will support those activities, I beg your pardon, <clears throat> And that will help us to sensitize and get people within the country to be at a place where they are very more accommodating and accepting. And the minister talked earlier about Jamaicans wanting food speeding. And that's what we really have to be doing, actually, even at Jane Plus, going into the communities and doing this sensitization, talking about the various issues, 
for people to understand and to be more aware and more accommodating and dignifying the lives of people living with HIV. Um, Self-stigma dignity continues to be a problem here in Jamaica, especially when we look at the, the last stigma index done in 2019. And so those sessions with the community, those sessions with the gen population about people living with HIV and the varied issues are necessary to chant a progressive way forward. And I'll stop there. for us um I think I'm I still muted. okay um in 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 adding to that conversation devon if you could just explain quickly for the gleaner the types of stigma and discrimination experiences that our populations would have had okay thank you um in responding to the question um, uh, it's it's important to know that while we may not have the the exact figures for the the amount of discrimination that happens, whether in urban or rural, we do know and understand the environment in which we, we, we this discrimination happens. Um, Jamoke alluded to community settings, but you also have institutional settings such as school or issues of justice or access to justice. Um, there are types of discrimination that, that ranges from harassment to actual physical and emotional and even financial where persons are, are, are deprived of their work. So workplace uh, harassment, workplace discrimination is also another one. Uh, to be, but we must be mindful uh, when we look at that dichotomy of urban, that while in the urban settings, at least you have resources available. Uh, what why we do have why we need to be mindful of our enabling environmental human rights as a country on a whole is that enabling environment speaks to those vulnerable populations that we don't normally remember. So we must remember rural communities. Yeah? What are the resources that are out there? Uh, are those communities more informed about rights? how to access it, how to promote it, how to, and how to, to protect it. It is for that reason, therefore, that uh, the response uh, through the National Family Planning Board and the Ministry of Health, the Global Partnership, we partner with other agencies such as the Social Development Commission because we need to reach community groups and actors uh, in inner city, for lack of a better term, urban centers, but we also need to reach those areas such as Chalky Hill or Belmont in, in, in Westmoreland, places where persons may not have access, ready access to the media centers, uh, but still need to, need to access medication and services. Uh, that said, uh, we, we are also partnering with these agencies, the regional health authorities, with the Jamaica Council of Churches, with the various uh, civil society at Jamoki would, uh, would remind us, so that we can collect more evidence of what is happening in all of these settings, at home, on the communities, on the street, in the yard, at, uh, uh, at the workplace, in school. So there is a judge, as Jamoki has mentioned, mm -hmm. there it is uh, the Jamaica anti-discrimination, uh, anti the Jamaica HIV related anti discrimination system. Uh, we're also working with other agencies such as the Ministry of Health, um, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. You know, the, the, the this Ministry of National Security, they have their own re reporting and redress mechanisms and systems. And uh, what's more significantly, if you look behind me, I've taken the opportunity to shamelessly show off some of the kind of um, material and the kind of messaging that we need more of our partners to adopt, to promote uh, an environment of respect. Okay. Yes. Right, because we need more persons to report these cases, but also mm -hmm. to seek redress and to seek justice. All right, great. Regardless of where they live. Absolutely, so again, the NSPB and the JADS and other agencies would be ensuring that they're in the communities 
Ricky and senior hand, and I will get to you in another two minutes. Out of respect for all the attendees here, we're going to be asking that we go until 9.15, which is in another six minutes time. I'm seeing a question from the Gleaner, two more that we will throw to the panel. I think perhaps Jamoki and Devon, one of you would be best positioned to answer this. The Gleaner is saying that there was an instance in which a dancehall artist claimed that she was doing better than others because she's not HIV positive. And I think we can understand the sociocultural norms. So the question is, is that a form or instance of discrimination? And then another quote was put forward, damn right my love, the right me live because my HIV negative. Forgive me, I'm, I'm without my glasses and I'm trying to read the patto. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, how do these messages combat and challenge and contradict some of the efforts, um, perhaps Jomoki, and what do you see as our work in, in pushing and, and ensuring that we address some of these things? Um, is that direct discrimination? I would more so stigma than anything and, and how we feel and think about HIV and people living with HIV. Um, I think a lot of work is needed to sensitize and educate the mass as to where we are in terms of HIV treatment, care, and support. And in this particular case, and in our culture, um, many of us on this call would have been in conversations or in our growing up would have heard these very same things that Shensia is expressing about people living with HIV. It's a death sentence and it, it, it shows up in certain way and it affects your body in certain way. And so we still live with those ideas and those thoughts and those conversations that we have had many years ago. So what is required for that shift or that transformation is a continuous conversation, a continuous awareness, a continuous involvement of even dancehall artists, artists in general, public figures who can use their platforms to provide information, build capacity, have those conversations, even with people outside of the HIV response, even with people who are not HIV positive. Because like I said earlier, there is so much of a, a direct relationship with HIV on other socio-political issues that are affecting us as a country. And so how do we use those platforms, those persons to continue to education, to continue to the, the upliftment and the empowerment yeah. of people living with HIV. And the other thing I will add to it as well, and because of such conversations and such talks by persons like Shensia, then people living with HIV still feels discriminated. It gives power to those persons to still say things about people living with HIV. So for us, for all of us as Jamaicans globally, it's just the more work needs to be done, more conversations are needed so that we can do the work moving forward and perhaps we need to set up a little meeting with Shinsia. <laughs> <laughs> all right um Michael, to you um, Stefan the, the, the yes. national for planning board for that reason um through the Ministry of health and mm -hmm. the ccm the country coordinating mechanism for the global fund for that reason why we've um said that we're not only we don't only need a general human rights campaign but we also need a campaign around enabling empowering champions for change, uh, influencers, uh, persons. I learned, I listened to that song. In fact, this morning, I'm a 16 year old. And so I hear this music all the time. This song does start off with that statement that I'm not positive. But if you listen to the song, she actually speaks to the, the steps she has, she's taking, positive steps she's taking to prevent the further transmission of HIV. I think that there is opportunity, as Jamoke has said, to educate okay. persons on the hurtfulness of shaming and stigmatizing the otherness of around HIV that happens. But at the same time, we must look for opportunities to embrace artists like Chensia, who are extremely talented and have the ability to shift not a few, a few minds, but thousands, if not millions. Uh, if you go into the, the song itself, she starts off with that statement, but she actually yes. speaks to being empowered, to being safe, and to keeping her body free from other types of diseases. So it's a build so on the latter artists part like of her and others can, 
yeah, they can be educated, they can be brought, they can be sensitized, and they can be reminded of our rights. And one of our, one of our rights is not only to promote or you know promoting our right of expression that we do not cause more harm. And so there are opportunities to build her up and to make her a stronger ally and to make her strong, even more impactful. All right, also, and another question, and Devon, just to quickly follow up. The Gleaner is asking, last question from the Gleaner before I get to Ricky. What was the success or the challenge? What are some of the successes and challenges with the campaign that would have been undertaken by the National Family Planning Board? The most recent um, one you had last. Okay, year. you know we're um, as a as an agency and as part of the response, we have to be data driven, evidence evidence based, data driven. Uh, anecdotally, we've gotten very positive feedback. Um, any campaign that speaks to things that are outside of the norm, if it's provoked, if it's provocative, it gets people to say, but I don't experience that. I don't see that. What are you talking about? I think that is good. There's one in which, for instance, where a policeman is, a police officer is being so polite and where the woman is being um, you know, strident and she knows what she's saying. Believe it or not, there are people who say, but not Agosa or Jamaica. But that is the point. That is the point. It must provoke, it must evoke, and it must also show what, what is the best practice or the best way of going forward. Um, so anecdotally, we've gotten very positive feedback, dollars and cents. The Office of Public Defense Defender has not run away from the campaign. In fact, they're running to the campaign. They're giving even more of their own resources. Um, they are now, they're funding, uh, they have helped to fund an a, a, a ongoing radio program about knowing your rights. Um, we, the or, organization. Sorry to, it, Sorry to cut you. Okay. Um, uh, before no, you move on, no, I'm again no asking for I just want to show people it is a dynamic campaign that is supported, mm -hmm. that is being invested. As you can see, we're also from having the materials and we're also going out into the community. COVID-19, as this report shows, has not stopped our need for enabling environment and human rights. And therefore, this response has embraced virtual sessions, smaller face-to-face -face groups. We've gone out to other partners and tried to work with them. The work is getting done. More work has to be done. The human campaign must continue. Lastly, monitoring evaluation, there will be an impact assessment evaluation and we'll be doing recalls and all of the other um, research to not only see the impact of this campaign, but also to guide future campaigns coming down the pipe. All right, thank you so much. We will just take two more questions in the interest and respect of person's time. Ricky Pasco, please go ahead. And we have our m and &E manager here from Jamaica Aid Support for Life, who will respond to the earlier question, which was asked around PrEP, and then we will go to close. Ricky, go ahead, and my apologies for the delay in acknowledging the question. Not a problem, uh, Mikkel. Well, it's not necessarily a question. It's just a, just a few comments, quick, quick, okay. quick comments. And, yeah, and it's around. Jamoki mentioned some of them. But first, let me commend the, the, the group, let me commend us on the work that we have been doing thus far in, in stigma and discrimination, because I usually tell persons I've been a part of the response since the mid nineties and I've seen where discrimination, stigma and discrimination is affecting groups and the changes over, over the years. One of the things I want to highlight though, is the importance of, and Jamoki mentioned it, is the importance of grappling with, the community is still grappling with instances of internal and perceived stigma. The, the surveys that we have done over the years have shown that, shows, shows that the latest stigma index that we did shows that family planning board did a stigma, a, a, a survey, it shows that as well. J, Jamaica, JCW Plus did a survey, it shows that as well. So you have to do, do more work in terms of, because the realities I usually say, if we fix all the systems, all the, the, the health sectors, all the health centers, everything comes in, comes in place and people are not 
how would I put it? People are still grappling with internal and perceived stigma. Then people will not necessarily want to go out to access services or access what 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 is there because they are they are still grappling with this. So more work needs to be done around that. Ten more we, seconds, Ricky. Yeah, man, we still have to work on what we call the enabling environment because once we work more on that, then we have more people coming out to possibly disclose their their status or disclose so that they're HIV positive. We also have to do more work with the individual who are HIV positive, the PLHIV themselves, because the reality is people, for them to understand stigma and discrimination is an entirety, because the reality is, even though people are still positive, people are still discriminating against each other. So we have to, uh, we have to also get people to understand those nuances so that those work or those instances don't happen and don't further to, to, to grapple what we, we want to do. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and, and again, Ricky is a member of the, the civil society organizations that we work with. So his insights are always quite useful. Uh, Mr. Zeva Big, some Jamaica aid support for life. No more than 45 seconds, if that much, to just clarify the question around PrEP and, and the work that JASA would have been doing with the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Okay, so I, I hope you're able to hear me. I'm, I'm in transit. The, the Jamaica Aid Support for Life has partnered with the Ministry of Health and Wellness first and foremost to implement a PrEP pilot. PrEP is seen as a best practice for risk reduction or as a prevention strategy. And as such, we've partnered with the Ministry of Health and Wellness first and foremost to pilot such a campaign within the Jamaica space. Beyond that, the ministry, as the ministry currently contemplates its report on how to implement in, in a national way, the Jamaica Aid Support for Life continues to implement PrEP through the Kingston office with high-risk communities, such as men who have sex with men, Sarah Discord and couples, among other high-risk groups. The partnership with the Ministry of Health includes access to the drugs. At present, the Ministry of Health is the with the exception of a few private suppliers, is the primary provider of the drugs in Jamaica. And so the partnership allows us to access those drugs in an ongoing kind of way to maintain the intervention. So that in the, in the way you intended or how it was asked, I missed the question. Um, no, that's perfectly it, Xavier. I think the only thing that we will add is that we, in 2020, we had 41 men who were successfully a part of the pilot and I think we are continuing with some 77 persons in the program now. So it has moved from pilot to now being a part of service delivery through yes. our Kingston chapter. To, to implementation, yes. So there are so yes, so you are correct. 77 individuals are currently accessing the program. Um, a portion of that have cycled off because their risk profiles have changed, but the mm -hmm. project or the program is being implemented at Jamaica Aid Support for Life currently. All right, thank you so much, Xavier. And I, Glenn, Glenn, my apologies. Sometimes when you write these reports and so on, you know, the memory goes. But I hope that Xavier and I, we would have clarified the question that was asked. Before we wrap up, again, all courtesies would have been observed. We do thank the UN Aids for putting together this partnership. We extend our appreciation to Mrs. Manova's leadership, Mr. Javier Nelson as the consultant, and Mr. Ruben Pages, our community advisor, the sage, the wise one for us. So thank you so much to UNH. We obviously extend our appreciation to the state minister, Mrs. Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, for our leadership, her leadership, sorry, as the chair of the Jamaica Partnership. And obviously our panel here, our the persons who would have been guiding us, Mr. Devon Gabriel, Mr. Jamoke Patrick, and Dr. Shannon Hedo, we extend our appreciation to the media uh, who would have been covering this event for us, and obviously our attendees for sitting in. We went 23 minutes over time, but your attention to this launch of the 2020 annual report of the enabling environment and human rights is certainly appreciated. Mr. Nelson will close us out with a video. So Mr. Nelson, over to you. 
Yo, this is ZJ Sparks. Now, you know when we know the party is pure vibes. You know that already, right? We just make sure that we create an all-inclusive space for everybody so them can come to the party, de-stress, enjoy themselves, and suspend themselves from reality. Now, let me switch it up a little bit. You have persons who, of course, are HIV positive. Nothing wrong with that. If them disclose them status to you, it's all right. It don't make them any different. Don't discriminate. Allow a man to live him life as positively as he can. And guess what? It's so in the space open up again. When outside open up again, we're we'll gonna party have a good time. Same way. Live positive. Walk good. Thank you so much, Javen. That was great. And congrats. <laughs> have a good day, everyone. Uh, Mrs. Manova, any last words for you before we 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 okay. Thank All right. you so much for everyone's participation. All right, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Have a good Friday and weekend. Jamaica, home of the